these are two graphs that show up. The red line is the income distribution for the top 10%. The blue line is for the bottom 90%. And you notice all through the Great Compression, the blue line was higher than the red line. And then look at the reversal. Look at in 2012, the bottom 90% actually lost income. Now they're slightly gaining it, but the top, it's the wealthiest 1% of more wealth than ever before in history. And this was also another interesting one. This is the net wealth owned by the top, the bottom 90%. And it was about here when Reaganomics began. Here's the wealth of the top 0.1%. And by 2014, the top 0.1% had had greater wealth in the top 90 and then the bottom 90 percent. Now they have lost it. I will have to say though, in the stock market that's crashing right now, those with a lot of wealth are losing money to have so much money in investments. Elon Musk has lost something like uh, $21 billion in the last two months. So now he's only worth like $240 billion. I'm thinking about sending him a care package, but <laughs> You might have to send that to various uh, flight attendants on various things, but that's another story for down the road. So, they, but it worked. I mean, that's what concerns economic climate. They want to funnel money to the wealthy, and it's worked incredibly well. Has it trickled down? You be the judge of that. So the election of 84, though, Reagan was writing the better economy. And he ran against the former vice president, Walter Mondo. It was Carter's vice president. Mondo from Minnesota. Mondo ran this kind of weird scolding campaign. Reagan was writing a high good advantage of just the feeling that things were getting better. And Reagan would win. It didn't seem like it was going to be this big of a victory. It turned out in the with a month before the election. But it turned into a massive Republican landslide. Where Reagan won. The popular vote being 54%, but still, a, or 58%, a huge victory in the Electoral College. It's kind of shocking. Your Mondale only won his home state and the District of Columbia. And so Reagan was riding a wave. Now, things would begin to fall apart. There'd be a stock market crash in 87 and a few other things. But I should add, 85, in beautiful Mile City, guess who graduated from high school? You want to see a couple pictures from Mile City? Yes. So here's me in my government class. I'm right there. That's Mr. Krakowski in the front, George. And yes, I did participate in athletics. You want to see a picture of me playing? Here's my cricket team. And that's me with the top hat right there. There is no photographic evidence of me as a child. I just appeared. I just surprised everybody as this 18 year old. So with that, back to this. My parents did, my mom actually um, did find. So for parents night in football, you know, they, they give you a picture and she found my picture. That they gave the parents of me in my football uniform. Parents. Yeah, you know. To me, in, in shoulder pads, my jersey. I think that's all we had on the picture. Trying to look tough. <laughs> no, you're not seeing that picture. But Mikhail Gorbachev was the new leader of the Soviet Union. And he. A basketball one, I think, I think. So. But. Mikhail Gorbachev wanted to save the Soviet Union. He was trying to make this in like save it and create the actual socialist place, the socialist uh, paradise they talked about back in 1917 at the time as authoritarian hellhole. But the only way to do it was the end of Cold War. The arms race was destroying the Soviet Union. And Reagan agreed to diplomacy. Here's them meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland. Conservative, that's cons. 
conservatives in his own party were furious with Reagan for actually doing diplomacy. But Reagan was pretty much startled by how close the world came to absolute nuclear annihilation. And so they did make an agreement to limit intermediate nuclear forces. And the big one we need, Reagan's out of office, but in 1989, the START degree, the Strategic Arms Reduction Talk, START. And so there was real arms control. And Gorbachev probably deserves the most credit, but Reagan was willing to do, to go away from his own party and negotiate. And the, and the Soviet Union began to open up free speech, open up the economy, and it looked like the Cold War was winding down, but nobody really knew when. And a lot of people were like, Gorbachev, it's just a plot. He really wants to take over the world. But Afghanistan was still going on. The United States was aiding the anti-Soviet forces called the Mujahideen as just generic freedom fighters or religious fighters. And they actively recruited Islamic fundamentalists to go fight in Afghanistan. So they would go to places with a huge fundamentalist Islamic population, like let me throw a country out here, Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia wanted to get rid of these troublemakers and they sent them to Afghanistan. Money funneled through Pakistani secret police would fund groups like a base for Islamic fundamentalists. The Arab word for the base is Al Qaeda. And their leader, the son of a very wealthy Saudi family, Osama bin Laden, who was convinced that Saudi Arabia was becoming a decadent state going against their Islamic principles, partially because of the United States. But he went to go fight the Soviets, Osama bin Laden. There are Mujahideen fighters, these are Russian forces. But Russia, by 1985, it was clear, they were not winning. They controlled the major cities and they could not hold out. And after eight years of horrible fighting, Russia retreated. In essence, they were defeated. They left a puppet government that survived for almost a decade, but civil war would rage. And eventually, Pakistani secret police, with the help of the United States, would back a group called the Taliban. Taliban it was the name of a group of tribes that fought against the British 100 years earlier. So they took a name that was very popular, very fundamentalist Islamic faith. And they controlled the southern part of Afghanistan. But the Civil War would rage into the next century. But after that, I mean, the U.S. basically did nothing. And so there was a lot of resentment in Afghanistan against the United States as they saw using Afghan blood to fight the Soviets. Especially with a group like Al-Qaeda that was furious. And they remain in the Civil War, but also now, as they see it, the bigger threat, the United States. Also, one of the biggest controversies at this time called Iran Contra. Reagan, secretly violating the law, sent weapons to Iran to free U.S. hostages being held in Lebanon. There was a Civil War in Lebanon. Groups that were backed by Iran were holding Americans hostages. Hostage. Some were murdered. The U.S. secretly sold weapons to Iran. They were fighting Iraq at that time. Violating the law. And then turned around and gave that money to U.S.-backed right-wing revolutionaries called Contras, counter-revolutionaries, who were fighting in Nicaragua. Also violating the law. They violated some 23 federal laws. Out of, in fact, it was all being run out of the basement of the White House. 19 high-level members of the, of the Reagan administration were indicted. That no presidential administration in history has had more members indicted of this than the Reagan administration. Federal crimes. Trump's the second most. But, no charges were against Reagan because Reagan had no idea what was going on. 
He said, I do not know or I do not recall 130 times on the deposition about things going on in his administration. And a lot of people implied it was like rogue elements of administration. It appears to be more that he was completely in the throes of dementia. And they were hiding the extent that Alzheimer's was beginning to take. Remember back in 1919 when President Wilson had a stroke when he was trying to get the Treaty of Versailles ratified and kept that secret? It appears like the same thing. They keep a lot of secrets. This is probably not appropriate. I, I don't think it's appropriate, but they did. And Reagan was able to get off. So the election of 1988, Reagan's popularity was relatively low. But the economy was still doing pretty well. So his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, who actually called Reaganomics a voodoo economics when he was running against him for president in 1980, he was also pro-abortion rights until he became vice president. Then went against abortion rights because he wanted to be vice president. He would run. Running against the governor of Massachusetts named Michael Dukakis. And Dukakis was seen as one of those new Democrats who's becoming more conservative, trying to get this urban elite going against the traditions of the Democratic Party. <laughs> Bush, who was a war hero in World War II, in fact, his plane was shot down over Palu Island while fighting the Japanese, and he barely made it out alive. Two other American aircraft or carrier planes, or they're called Avengers, torpedo bombers that were shot down. The crews were captured by the Japanese, the Japanese executed him. So he barely made it out of water. He was a war hero. But remember I told you about image? Now it matters more. And because he didn't have the image of this very masculine man like Reagan, who did not fight in the war at all, they, people said he had the wimp factor. And yet he was a war hero. And that's to show you how ridiculous it got for image, but how much that image seems to matter. And virtually every presidential candidate will try to portray this image beyond the reality of who they are. Well, the election was relatively close, but Bush would win the election. And so with a Bush victory, he had a big benefit. Just the year after he's elected, the Cold War just ended. Boom, boom. Gorbachev allowed for free elections in Eastern Europe. Those areas behind the Iron Curtain. And one by one, these countries had elections that ousted their former Soviet, pro Soviet governments. The last holdout was West Berlin, or I'm sorry, was East, East Germany. On November 8, 1989, there was a mass protest in East Berlin, and they started marching towards the wall. And that night, the soldiers, East German soldiers and police, disobeyed orders and didn't open fire. And once that happened, they swarmed over the wall. Soon they took sledgehammers and beat down holes in the wall. That poster shows up in the morning after. And I can remember watching this, it was in the morning. I was in college at the building. I said, I didn't go to class that morning, so I was watching this on the relatively new network called CNN. And I'm watching this, I cannot believe it. Cold War zone. It just happened like that. So my sister-in-law married a Berliner. He was in high school. He was a senior, equivalent of a senior in high school in Berlin. He was in West Berlin. And he remembers kind of being let out of school and running to the wall and all these East Germans were pouring over just like, ah. and they were meeting them and that they could not believe West Berlin. And it just happened so fast. But even though the Soviet Union would finally collapse in 1991, inside the former Soviet Union, 16 countries were created, but Russia was kind of a mess. And pretty soon, all their state-owned factories would be turned over to a few wealthy people, now we call oligarchs. And eventually, what kind of government would Russia create? They had elections. It's an authoritarian state where it's, I would say, close to unity for fascism. It's a fascist state. 
And so it didn't really solve the issues. And poor Russia's gone through that. And then, yes. East Germany. Yeah. The imminent secret police, they were ordered to fire. And just they just didn't do it. The civilians started marching. It happened. I mean, it's fun. I still say things like East Germany, West Germany, Czechoslovakia. I still say stuff like that. Well, that leads almost directly to the Gulf War. Now, the original Gulf War, when I was your age, was this horrible Iran Iraq war. After the Islamic Revolution, Iraq attacked Iran, fearful that it would spread over the borders. Iraq had a new dictator named Saddam Hussein, who the US supported through the CIA. After some initial success, the war turned into a bloody quagmire, a trench warfare like World War I. Hundreds of thousands were killed. Both countries would be devastated. The U.S. actually aided both sides. U.S. and West Germany even sent mustard gas to Iraq. They used that mustard gas against Iranians, but also against their own civilians in Iraq. That's the side we were supporting. Well, Iraq, after the war, broke, devastated by this war. Still had a big army, but devastated. They blamed Kuwait, this little country right here, for high oil prices. And they said Kuwait should be part of Iraq. They've always been part of Iraq. And they invaded in 1990. I should add, Kuwait was created by the British in 1899. Iraq was created by the British after World War I. Iraq was created by the British for oil. So Britain is to blame for all these problems here. So we can blame Britain for almost everything, right? With me on that? Even though Iraq, the US ambassador to Iraq actually kind of implied, we don't have a problem with you taking Kuwait. Then the US reacted. And we claim they're going to attack Saudi Arabia too. And we convinced Saudi Arabia to allow them to send US troops to Saudi Arabia. Eventually, 500,000 troops that were stationed in West Germany. Sent them to Iraq. Australia, France, Britain, even Syria, 39 total hundred centuries. But the bulk were US to liberate Kuwait. Kuwait was no friend of the United States, but the US got involved. And that's going to be the Persian Gulf War, almost certainly for political reasons and oil. So troops were sent to Saudi Arabia. Well, we're not going to go through the details of the war. Iraq did not have an air force, really. The few planes that have were washed out of the skies, and Allied bombers destroyed the Iraqi army, and they would quickly push out of Kuwait out of But the U.S. left Hussein in power. He remained in power. The U.S. thought if we take out Hussein, there'll be civil war in Iraq. We'll be involved for years. And we want them to kind of counterbalance Iran. But the U.S. put really strict sanctions, even no-fly zones, over Iraq because they were developing what we would call WMD, weapons of mass destruction. The big one is they were working on nuclear weapons. Their program was destroyed, but the sanctions would remain until 2003. Here is parts of the devastation of the attack. I should go back to Saudi Arabia one more thing. What is the most holy spot in the Islamic? Jerusalem number three. Mecca is number one, then Medina, then Jerusalem. Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was also created after this. While I'm looking at you now, it was created right after World War I also. There has never been a non-Christian army in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia allowed U.S. and other troops, uh, non, I'm sorry, non-Islamic army. The United States, uh, Saudi Arabia allowed U.S. troops, and they remained out there. I wonder if there will be any group that we kind of said about this. Maybe a former Saudi by the name of Osama bin Laden. I'm sure, and it will say this is part of a corrupt government in Saudi Arabia and a plan for U.S. to totally take over and destroy us. 
yes, I'm leading to something. I think you all know what I'm leading to, right? And so with that, but Hussein and immediately said, I survived the U.S. and I'm in power. And this would become kind of an embarrassment for Bush and his son. And with a small recession in 1991, Bush's popularity tanked and he would lose for re-election. Bill Clinton, I did not write him down, but Bill Clinton would lead a Democratic way. But it was dominated by new Democrats who were neoliberal, a.k.a. conservative pushing market solutions while the free market takeover, get rid of regulations, get rid of controls over business and banking and finance, and that will raise all boats, basically continuing Reaganomics. So Clinton would win. A third party candidate by the name of Ross Perot jumped in, angry at this thing called NAFTA. He would actually get nearly 30% of the vote in Montana. And that's why Montana went to Clinton. He took away votes from Bush. That's the last time Montana's voted for a Democrat. At least a Democrat got the vote. Three electors. Now we have four again. And overall, parole got almost 19% of the vote. So all we need to know is Bush won for, um, did not win his re-election. Clinton is now president. And the big thing Clinton pushed for and also showed his neoliberal roots going away from the tradition of the old New Deal Democrats of fighting for workers' rights and higher wages, he did the exact opposite by pushing through something that is already being negotiated called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, to get rid of tariff barriers between these three countries, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And the thought was this will explode trade between the the three countries, U.S. industry will go up, open up free trade, boom. The exact opposite happened. Outsourcing. Remember what outsourcing means. Building factories in other countries. What happened? The U.S. over the next seven years began as fast as they could. U.S. companies shut down factories in the United States and built factories in Mexico. And in the next decade, started doing it all over Latin America. What happened to those jobs? Is there something on your phone? On your watch? What happened to the jobs in the United States? And what happened? What kind of jobs replaced those manufacturing jobs in the states like Ohio and New York? Much lower paying kind of service jobs. Or if you want to go to the cities, this gutted things. Just gutted this area here. It's kind of indescribable what happened. This used to be called the Rust Belt with all the factories. By 2005, almost all of them shut as they moved to Mexico and other places. Why they moved to Mexico? They paid the workers 120 of the amount, no environmental. And this really did radicalize these areas. And without a doubt, in 2016, President Trump would run against NAFTA, promising to get rid of it. That's part of the reason why he won. He states with like a president. Now, they did get rid of NAFTA, but replaced it with something that was exactly the same. So they kept the same thing still going on. But his image was he was going to do something. It's a big deal. But it also destroyed Mexico. Just devastated Mexico. Mexican farmers, and that's why the lines through them, would be crushed. Small farmers destroyed by cheap American imports imported food. They lost their farms, became indebted. Billions, literally, would become undocumented immigration immigrants to the United States. And especially by 1999, 2000, not near as many now, but that legacy remained. That's where you get the growing nativism. And the legacy of that would lead to, once again, back to President Trump talking about doing something that wasn't possible and they would never do it, building a wall. Why? Well, this just crushed them. And I should add, when all those small towns, especially in northern Mexico, were just destroyed, impoverished, there's a vacuum. Who moved in? What groups began to dominate? The drug companies. 
they moved in because people were desperate. They passed something similar called the Central American Free Trade Agreement in 2004. Guess what happened in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua? Same thing. Or El Salvador. Same thing. Then El Salvador decided to go on Bitcoin, and that has collapsed because there's always a Ponzi scheme. I feel really sorry for El Salvador. But 96, though, Clinton would win a, a, a resounding election, partially for it because of a tech boom. So Clinton would win re-election, 96. But Democrats were not doing as well. Clinton, the Democrat, won. But traditional Democratic areas were becoming Republican, angry over a combination of a number of things. The Southern strategy, this path, that could have been a shiv in my back. Not here. And then Clinton was impeached. Clinton, there was a, there was a couple of potential scandals in Arkansas that Republicans took back control of the House they were investigating. And Clinton had to give a deposition. In this deposition, he's asked a surprising question about an extramarital affair that he denied. Well, he lied. And lying on a deposition is violating, this is a federal deposition, violating federal law. Because he was having an affair with an intern, a young intern, 20, over 20 years younger than him, named Monica Lewinsky. He was having this affair in the Oval Office. So, using that violation, the House would impeach him, the Republican controlled House. But the Senate did not convict him. And I should add, even a lot of people were appalled at Clinton's behavior. What happened to his approval? It was up over 70 percent by the way. People were furious. Many people thought the Republicans had overstepped their bounds because they did not like Clinton. And so they impeached him. And so even though Democrats would be kind of tainted by this, he left office relatively popular. Yet, his legacy would be very mixed. There would be a big tech boom. The first really big computer boom, the internet boom. But this led to a bubble that would crash, if we look down here in 2000, a precursor to what's coming eight years later. But also, he deregulated everything. They could regulate the stock market, he even repealed Glass Steagall. Glass Steagall was the New Deal era law. Remember that one that regulated banks? By getting rid of that, within a decade, the entire world's economy would be crushed. <coughs> and this is a beating of both Republicans and Democrats cheering them off. And it was a real betrayal of the old New Deal coalition. And so even though his vice president would run for, for office, and the economy, even though there was a the bubble big crash, was not in, was still seemingly strong, he's going to be tainted by this. Oh, I should add one more thing. The gap between the rich and the poor grew at the fastest rate ever, even faster than Reagan's years. It just started accelerating ever up to that time. Now it's growing. Well, except for the crash right now. So the election of 2000, Clinton's vice president, Al Gore, is going to run. But he's tainted by Clinton's scandal, even though Clinton was personally popular. George W. Bush, that's why it's W there. You always read off W. He's George Walker Bush. His dad was George Herbert Walker. He's the governor of Texas. He called himself a compassionate, compassionate conservative. Would run against gold. And everybody knew this was going to be a razor thin election. In fact, the Bush campaign was convinced that Gore would lose the popular vote, but maybe win the Electoral College. The exact opposite happened. Gore won the popular vote by 500,000. 
Yet, the Electoral College was razor thin and it came down to Florida. Florida. And here's Mock in the old Truman car cartoon with Truman holding up Dewey defeats Truman. But now it's. So what happened was the TV networks, they have exit polls. So if you go vote, I'm going to ask you some of these exit polls. But when people stand outside and they'll ask me who you voted for. And they'll release those out to the polls polls. And if it's a wide margin, they'll make a, they'll decide who they'll call the election. Well, a couple hours after Florida's election, a couple of the major networks called it called Florida for Bush. And if Florida went to Bush, Bush is elected president. And then they reversed it and said, we're not sure the war might have been. But it gave the feeling that Bush won. And so then going to the next day, it was unclear. And what became really clear is that there needed to be a recount because there was all kinds of problems with the Florida election. They were still using these old punch cards and it would go all the way to the Supreme Court. And the punch cards, you would punch through knock out the little piece of paper called a chat, and then run through the machines. Well, sometimes people didn't punch all the way through and the chat remained. And that's what he's using with his magnifying glass to see if they punched through it. It was, or it wouldn't read it if the piece of paper stayed on. They just put it this way. It was chaos. Yeah, I know. And that's what we have, like, election today. Like, you, when you vote in Montana, it's a scam phone. Yeah, they didn't have a scanner. They had these things. Well, the machines were, were 30 years old. It was a disaster. So the initial count had Bush barely up, but there were a significant number of ballots they threw up because it looked like they were voting for Gore. And the Gore campaign wanted a recount. The Bush campaign sued. And well into December, it was still a chaotic affair. And the Supreme Court ruled five to four, claiming 14th Amendment issues to stop the recount. And they gave it to Bush. They said, stop the recount. The country cannot handle it. Bush won. So the Supreme Court ruled to stop it. The ruling was so controversial. In the ruling itself, it is written. So this was done by Chief Justice Rehnquist. This can never be used as a precedent for future cases. Because they knew it was so convoluted. It's kind of shocking. The Supreme Court gave the election to Bush. Now, a couple different news agencies have done the recounts of the ballots, and, and both of them had Gore winning. So Gore would have been elected president, probably, but we're not going to remember these weren't official counts. But the point is, the Supreme Court just ruled. And boy, is the Supreme Court powerful now. Some of you are going to really find out in a few months. Just wait to see what they do with environmental laws. But that's another story. And so with that, there was a wave of big terrorist attacks. Now, there were actually the number of terrorist attacks had dropped since its height of the early 70s. But there were huge ones. In 93, groups affiliated to Al-Qaeda, part of local World Trade Center, with bombs packed into vans in the parking lot. Over 100 people were killed. 95, homegrown ultra-right wing terrorists blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City, killing almost 200 people, including 20 children. It was a daycare center, basically. In Saudi Arabia, U.S. troops are staying in this apartment building called the Kobar Towers, and suicide bombers affiliated with Al-Qaeda blew it up, killing 100 people. Two embassies in Africa, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Nairobi in Kenya, were bombed, killing over 300 people. Al Qaeda was killed. And a US destroyer called the Toll was hit by a suicide bomb when they packed explosives on a speedboat and rammed them in the harbor in Yemen. When Bush took office, they told him the number one threat to the United States was terrorist attack on Al Qaeda. They foiled an attempt by Al Qaeda to hijack planes and fly them into uh, various places in Europe, especially after Pakistan. So all of these things they knew about, but the Bush administration famously disregarded. Their big threat they saw it as China, and they wanted to get back at Iraq. 
So the United States was totally unprepared for what's coming. We all know what's coming, right? September 11th attack. <laughs> By the way, I was teaching in that room next door. <laughs> the next year I'm going to visit here. And I've been here ever since. <laughs> So Al Qaeda, so still in Afghanistan, the leader Osama bin Laden has been trying to get back to the United States, and he organized this audacious plan that should have been foiled. But three main reasons why. Number one, the U.S. support of these dictatorships, many of them were authoritarian monarchies. But the big thing, as their example was, and the thing they railed against, U.S. troops were being used. And they saw that showed the corrupting influence of the United States going to destroy Islam. Now, Bin Laden wanted to create an Islamic totalitarian state. So let's be very clear. He did not, um, he did not want democracies. Also, U.S. aid for Israel and the U.S. sanctions on Iraq that had killed over 500,000 Iraqis. Most of them, the elderly or children with lack of medicine. But what he wanted the United States to do was, if, the, if they could pull off at least part of this spectacular attack, he wanted the United States to attack in the Mideast. He wanted the U.S. just to start blowing things up. Because he thought that would convince people in the Mideast of what the threat of the United States. By the way, what would the United States do? Attacking. So he kind of got what he wanted. No, it did not turn out exactly the way he thought it would, but that's what he wanted. So four planes were hijacked. Where were most of the hijackers from? Anybody know what country? Almost all of them were Saudi Arabia. So naturally, the United States is going to attack. That's not going to be doing it. But four planes. The first two, there were two pilots in each one. They trained a little bit in the United States, and any time those pilots should have been caught. It was so close so many times. And then right before the attack, um, other people came, and they were going to be the muscle. They carried box cutters. And I know it would be really hard to carry a box cutter in now. My wife and I backpacked across Europe in the summer of 2001. So for seven weeks, we brought everything in one backpack, and we brought that in and carried it on the on board. And we had these little knife kits so we could you know, get food and eat pictures and stuff and try to save money. And both of our little kits had these little things with knives that were both about that long. Do things like cut shoes or whatever, you know. And not, we didn't even get a second look. It was perfectly fine to carry that in on the plane. So it wasn't surprising at all that the hijack was carried in box Seems almost amazing now, but whatever. Seems amazing, you know, just they did. So the World Trade Center was hit first. Uh, the South Tower was hit first. I'm sorry, the North Tower was hit first, but it's a little bit higher up. The South Tower second. But the second one crashed first because it's a little bit lower. That created kind of a critical mass that when the, uh, when the support structures collapsed, it collapsed. And when these fell, I was actually in, if you know where Mr. Solomon's room is, I was in that room. Mr. Solomon was still at Carroll College at that time. Is he in Carroll or still, he might have still been a building senior, I don't know. But um, I was in that room watching with another teacher who's long since retired. And then we saw that one collapse. But then I was in my classroom with my AP U.S. History class. We had the TV on, we are just all kind of stunned when we watched it. And when it collapsed, it was like someone exploded into a nuclear bomb. Just this wave of dust, storm, which covered much of Manhattan. People, that's that's color photo. Which is everything's covered with this layer of dust and asbestos and all the stuff that was in the insulation. Well, while that's going on. A plane that looked like it was on its way to attack probably the Capitol, maybe the White House, 
it did a 180 and turned and attacked the Pentagon. And the reason why is probably when they were flying by, the White House looked really, really small. The Capitol looked pretty small too. The Pentagon large still in the middle. So they literally looked like this. Probably thinking of secondary targets. But you get an idea, that's where it hit. This little area right there. The Pentagon is just mass. Has anyone ever seen the Pentagon? Yeah, it's kind of shocking how big it is. Another plane looked like it was on its way to either the Capitol or the White House, but people on board using cell phones because they couldn't control all the passengers heard about what was happening and they rushed the hijack. If the plane, the hijackers would probably just crash the plane. Right here, you know, Shanksville. That's Arizona, Shanksville, Texas. Okay. And this, almost 3,000 Americans died. Fortunately, most of the people in the World Trade Center that were there, most weren't there yet, luckily, were evacuated from the bottom of the plane. They, they rushed, they rushed the hijackers. So we don't know if the hijackers just crashed through and they tried to take off. We don't know because you haven't looked at The orders for the hijackers were if you're in trouble, in doubt, crash. So my guess is they were rushing the town to take the hijackers. But either way, it was supposed to, they, they stopped other things from getting paid. The passengers saved a lot of people's lives. Oh, I have to. Where is St. Paul? Oh, kind of the same thing. Yeah, I don't think they can find it. So we can argue. Try and do it for research. Well, they said that they're, they said they're going to attack. So they rush, they rush the hijackers, and then after that, we have no idea. Like, so. They saved the White House and the Capitol, but you know, doesn't take away from what they did. They saved. Yeah. Oh, but on that afternoon, that was a weekend. Oh, wear it down. Where have you been? I was sick. Sick with what? COVID? No. Good. Vibrating. Is that actually a place, Shanksville? Yeah. Little town, Pennsylvania. Do you have a gift for me? Uh, it's not a gift, it's a uh, 
This is the number I'm trying to use. Oh, yeah. Okay, the thing about Bacon's Rebellion, you have to get something about how uh, the big thing that came out of this was the slave codes. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah so you have to mention slave codes because all the slave codes, it's going to come. So this would be the slave codes. Yeah, yeah. That, and that would lead to what? Trying to get the slave trade and, and also racism. Yeah. You know, that, like, oh, there's a difference between them. Yeah, but they never thought of the opportunity. Our idea of race didn't even exist yet, which is kind of jealous. And uh, no, before that. Uh, what are you at? Uh, election. The big event of the election of 68 also was covered in racism. Or mentioned 68. With uh, Murphy and Murphy. Oh, okay. That's good. That looks good. That's fine, though. No. Yep. Uh, the missiles. Okay, that's good. Yeah, uh, there would be a, a boom in the 80s, but yeah, let's go. Okay, so you slave your votes, you have slave votes. So yeah, that, 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 that is the most important thing about making for them. Okay. Other than that, you look, you're in great shape. You're gonna do, you're gonna have votes. Yeah. Anything, any specific thing I should study this weekend? You know, just make sure you kind of go through. I, there's gonna be a very general question about the covered last week. Oh, okay. A few more on that. A few basic questions from the whole day. Okay. I mean, really simple. I'll probably just go over the last, like, bit. I mean, there'll be questions like, what's that DR? Oh. oh, okay. That's how you, you're going to have to Okay. I know how much time you put in for the APS, so I have taken that to account. Thank you. See you Monday. Yeah. <laughs> um, one question that project that you gave us, what did you do? You know, we do the last week, a regular week of school. Okay. What changes? I mean, I thought it'd be a little bit easier. I you guys worked on it. We're going to go back in on Monday. But it sounds like people got a lot of stuff done. I'm just uh, trying to find uh, two countries that are, that are, uh, that are like, I'm debating like maybe France and England. That sounds good. Because they've got some good medieval battles. That would be, you know, there are so many great places. Mm -hmm. And the easiest ones, because they're so close, would be close, would be, you know, Frank. And you can go to more than two countries. Okay. If you want. But at least two. 
Uh, but Britain, France, you know, Germany's right there, Spain is right there, Italy's right there, Belgium, Netherlands. You know. Yeah, I would, but just Paris and London, there's so many cool. Well, I was thinking like, like good, uh, decisive medieval battles, like the Battle of Hastings, Agincourt, and things like that. Yeah. That sounds awesome. What are we going to do today? Uh, uh, finish up that little bit of that video. A few notes. Go from there. Do we have a test at all next week? Uh, I think we'll probably have a test sometime. we got to get going. Well, some kind of things.
function. Drop back, don't break it. Got it. Break it, you want it. Okay, so I'll break the full group. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess like we do need the large projector up there. That's good. Sweet. Thank <laughs> you. 